just not my way. The only way that would have been done is to just keep it going. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us again this evening. I want to ask you to close your eyes with me and we'll pray before we start. Almighty God in heaven, King of kings, Lord of lords, we thank you so much for another evening of, of time with you, Lord. We pray for the power of your Holy Spirit to lead us in a very powerful way, leading us to experience your presence and getting to know your will and purposes for our lives. So pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Yesterday night, we talked about one of those biggest uh, topics in Christian history. One of the fundamental doctrines of the Christian church or the church of God is the doctrine of creation. When God created this world, he actually wanted the universe to know that he is the one in charge. And one of the, uh, the disas dis disastrous things that can ever happen in God's realm of things, the scheme of things, is that the story of creation can be mis misrepresented or is being undermined. It seems to me that over the past hundreds or maybe centuries of years ago, one of the things that has done, uh, one of the things that the enemies of the faith have done is to intentionally misrepresent the creation story. Because when you undermine God as the creator, everything of and about in God will fail into insignificance. So the pillar of the Christian faith is God's mighty power to create the world in six days. I remember many years ago in school when I was doing a theory of evolution in class, one of my teacher who was a Christian came and said, do you believe in this literal, uh, six literal day of creation story, he said. And I said, yes, I, I believe it. And he says, no, God didn't create a world taking six literal days. God was like a painter, he said. He was painting the world into existence over a very, very long period of time. And I, then I asked him, his name was Mr. Service, he's a British guy. So I said, Mr. Service, how do you uh, uh, explain the instant miracles that God Jesus performed when he was here 2,000 years ago? He could just command and something would happen. Lazarus came out of the tomb when he just literally commanded. That didn't take months of healing process. He just spoke and it happened. Don't you think that that powerful God who is fascinated in the person of Jesus Christ who can instantly create things could also instantly create his world and he didn't agree with me. So that was a, was a view of a Christian teacher, Christian uh, science teacher who felt that the world was created by God taking a long period of time. But I want to tell you this, the moment you try to undermine God as the creator, every other story fails into, fails into in, in, insignificance. Tonight is another of those very fundamental doctrines of the Christian church that I call a sacred institution. And you'll find out why I mean sacred institution. Let's commence. You know, this is a little uh, statement from Liz Hiles, the 60 minute speaker of Channel 9. And this is one of the uh, caption I got while, while she was talking. This is what she said. Police became so corrupt in Sydney, she said, the year was 1991. They became leading drug suppliers, organized armed robberies by officers in, in the holdup squad and even murderers. So 
in that particular 60-minute uh, episode, uh, Liz Hayes tells the story of the 80s year in Sydney where the corruption of the police force was so worse that you couldn't believe it. Now, how the cor uh, corruption of the police force was serviced was to this young lady here. Her name was Hextep and was born as Sally Hen Crifso uh, into a middle-class Jewish family. She left school at the age of seven and married a guy called Brian. And they were living in Western Australia, but they came to Sydney and she became a prostitute at the permission of her husband. Now, why did I bring this, uh, this lady's uh, image over here on the screen was because this woman is supposedly killed by a very highly sophisticated gang organization that was uh, operating directly linked with some of the very important personnel in the police department in the 1980s. And when she died, and before she died, she actually appeared in Channel 9 60 minutes years ago and exposed some of those corrupt deals in the police department. And unfortunately, in 1989, I think, she was murdered and killed. And no one has been brought to justice as yet of that young lady. Now, the guy responsible for all those people was a guy by the name of Roger Rogers, Rogerson. He was the chief, uh, chief detective in New South Wales Police Department. Very successful guy, and he was able to excel from from strength to strength in his professional life. But what was so mysterious was that this individual was named by the young girl to say that this individual was a leading figure in the corruption of the police department in New South Wales. Unfortunately, uh, this guy was arrested and was put behind bars. Just to give you a brief background of this man, 1999, Rogerson was convicted of perverting the course of justice and lay, lying to the Police Integrity Commission. He is also known for his association with other New South Wales detectives who are reputed to have been corrupted, including organized contract killings. So these police guys were not only killing criminals, but they became contract killers on behalf of other drug traffickers. So worse was the situation in the police department that is in, in Australia, Sydney, to be specific. Now, this young lady who exposed the Roger Rogerson was, was interesting because as I was listening to it, I realized that she left school at the age of 17. And one reason why she didn't find any meaning in life was because at the age of 17, her parents divorced. When her parents divorced, she left school, she left home, she was on the streets until she eventually got killed. And as I was reading or listening to the story, I thought to myself, wow, how terrible it is to divorce. Divorce is still a yearly issue here in Australia, ladies and gentlemen. The saying is marriage through misunderstanding and divorce through understanding. So young people try things out to start with. And then when they are in marriage, they realize that it was a terrible mistake. So they come out. But the unfortunate thing is that when those two individuals decide to come out of that, whatever the relationship they have gone into, they leave behind innocent lives, boys and girls alike, trapped in between presses of circumstances of are not of their doing. And many, many hundreds and if not thousands and millions of young people who are born in this kind of arrangement have either died like this young lady or committed suicide like this young, young, young lady or so many of them have never lived long enough to enjoy and appreciate the quality of life. So terrible is the concept of divorce. Divorce is really the opposite of marriage. If divorce is causing so much chaos and distress and problems everywhere, then we should pay attention to marriage even now. You see, the idea of marriage is a very, very political issue. Lately, 
Australia went into this marriage, I mean, in this, this uh, survey, to whether they should allow se same-sex marriage to take place. And it has split the citizens of this country in half. Many people supported, many people went, went against it. And such is the situation all over the world as I'm speaking today. For some reason, marriage has reduced to a social agenda, a political agenda, and other social institution. And when marriage goes wrong, the whole society collapses. But there is no accountability and responsibility to the institution of marriage itself. Now, misconception is this. Marriage is a choice of uninformed or stupid young people. And when they divorce, they become better informed. So this feeling that, well, we try things out of our stupidity and carelessness. And if it has been a mistake, we can jump out and then we'll become better informed. That is how they're saying. But ladies and gentlemen, I want to suggest to you that going into marriage is not a training experience for two stupid human beings. This is real. Marriage is a real thing. And real people come into existence as a result of those kinds of associations. And real people suffer when people don't honor their marriage commitments. So divorce is an issue. Every year, divorce can cause untold damage in the children more than parents who get divorced. And that is very true. The two individuals who get married are members of two different homes, culturally or socially, or, or, or in, in maybe racially as well. But the kids who are born have DNA. Their biological link is to the two parents. When the two parents split, the children, because they are biologically related to either of the two parents, they suffer in isolation and loneliness. And many times they pretend to smile. Many times they pretend to be okay. But deep inside, many of them grow up with a massive hollow deep inside, and they just can't, they just can't reconcile the realities of life with the hollowness they feel. Some of them, it's not because of the choice. They are just simply born into that mess. So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you, marriage is not just another social union of two individuals uniting in marriage and then splitting up any time when it is not working. It is not a social institution. The moment we reduce marriage into social institution, we are in loss. Miseries will involve. I would like to suggest that marriage is a sacred, holy institution associated with a sacred and holy God. Marriage is, as these are my own words, Marriage is as real as the sun, intricately linked to the earth by unchangeable gra gravitational force. A break from it will cause a massive damage to the children as it, would do, as it would do to the earth if it were to see there from the sun. So our earth is connected to the sun by very strong gravitational connections. When the gravity had to dislodge and if the earth were to set free, the earth would run on its axis and would self-destruct. So gravity that connects the earth to the sun is so crucial for the survival of earth itself. So it is with the power that combines two individuals together in marriage. I'm repeating what I just read. Marriage is as real as the sun, intricately linked to the earth by unchangeable gravi gravitational force. A break from it will cause massive damage to the children as it would do to the earth if it were to severe from the sun. Ladies and gentlemen, marriage is as powerfully connected as the planets or as the earth is connected to the sun. Divorce is almost impossible. It shouldn't happen. But when it does happen, it is as though the sun's gravitational pull on the planet has been dislodged. And it can't happen, but unfortunately, in the realm of human existence, it does happen. You know what? Jesus made this statement many years ago. It's been covered here. Sorry about that. Um, uh, I want to read here. Um, Jesus said that in the beginning, God created male and female, he said. 
And then again, Jesus said that for this man, for this reason, uh, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his, uh, to his wife and the two shall be one, Jesus said that. So what we are seeing here is that Jesus Christ intended for husbands and wives to be together. Here in Matthew 19, verse 6, we read, Wherefore they are no longer twine, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man put asunder. It's amazing, ladies and gentlemen, that this is the declaration of the God who impersonated himself or, or incarnated himself in the personification of Jesus. He is declaring that husband and wife who are married, who are joined by God, cannot be dislodged or separated because God's power had done it. The power that set the planets in orbit, in orbit the power that created the world, the power that, that commanded everything to fu function in their natural world, also declared that a husband shall clip unto his wife and let no man put asunder what God has put together. Unfortunately, the grave story, the heartbreaking story, the sad story is that divorce do take place in a lifetime. And people who go through the divorce process is an heartbreaking experience. And they may recover, the men may recover, the women may recover and marry someone else. But the children, they will live with a scar for the rest of their life. Matthew 5.31, the Bible says, he had been said, Jesus said, making this story, story, a statement, whoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a, a, a written or writing di divorcement. So this was the fabrication of humanity in history. God never mandated divorce, but somehow humanity has decided to reinterpret the instruction never to divorce into providing an arrangement like this. Well, if a man want to divorce, give a written certificate of divorce. That's what he said. And Jesus is making reference to that. But now I'm telling you, he said, that whoever put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whoever shall marry her, that is, that is divorce, committed adultery. So that means there is no room to break free the connectedness that must exist between a husband and wife. Why is that so necessary? Well, I'm going to tell you in a little while. But look at this text. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 22, the Bible says, Whoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favor of the Lord. So that means discovering a husband or discovering a wife is almost as though you have discovered hidden treasure. You know, gold is precious, diamond is precious, and one of the reasons why they are so precious is because they are not in abundance. Apart from the quality of the work those two metals do, they are also rare, and they are rarely discovered or rarely found. They could be found in some very solid rocks, in some isolated mountains, or some places of obscurity, you'll find gold. Now, what the Bible is trying to portray here is that the real man or the real woman, a young person would want to marry, would be like an explorer going out there looking for that precious gem. So if you have found that precious gem, according to Proverbs, you have found a good thing and obtained favor with the Lord. So God leads people in discovering whoever they will marry. So young people, if you're listening to me in this sermon tonight, I want to tell you that, you know, God will lead you to discover that precious gem of your life. Genesis 1.27, the Bible says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. God engineered humanity and God engineered and created two human beings who are human beings in equal in every way, except one is a male and one is a female. What is the principle behind creating one male and one female? 
They are human beings, all right, equal in everything. The, physio the body makeup and every other thing is okay, except that one is male and one is female. The difference that exists between these two individuals is not for them to compete, but it is for them to complement each other. Complementing exists when there is this principle we commonly use called love. When you love someone, you will be there, there for that individual and for that individual will also be there for you in order to love to be pure, love to be active, love to exist. There are two individuals who have the potential to love must also exist. That's an interesting concept we find in the book of Genesis. Genesis 1.28 says, and God blessed them and told them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so God created them not just for them to be friends only, but there's something else. They had to reproduce and replenish the earth. Yesterday I made a statement, God only gave the ability to create other human beings to humanity only. No angel got a privilege. The devil doesn't have that privilege. Only humans can produce other human beings. Genesis 2, 18, the Bible says, and the Lord God said, is it not good that man should be alone? I will make him an elf meat for him. So that means the first parts of the verses that I showed indicated that God created men and women to reproduce. But this particular verse tells us that men and Ad men met Adam and Eve, not for them to be coming together to just produce kids. No, they were beings with social needs, and therefore they were to be best friends and live together as, as, as friends and united in every way possible. Genesis 2 verse 21, the Bible says, this is the concept of the origin of marriage, and the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof, and then out of that, uh, and, and the rib which, which the Lord had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto man. So the creation of Eve was never, never another material. In other words, he didn't get clay again for some reason. Clay he got and created Adam. But Eve, not from clay, from the bone. So there is this interesting concept that Adam had to care for this because she was flesh of your flesh and bone of your bone. So what is the principle behind? The principle behind is marriage relationship is so intimately clo clo close as though they are sharing the same bone, as though they're sharing the same flesh, as though they're thinking through the same process, even though they're two identically different, they're not identical twins, they're different individuals, yet God mysteriously designed them so they can complement neatly to produce this big, powerful union of the two individuals. That is the definition of love. You cannot be love without having someone to love. Love has to be exercised when there is someone else to love. Genesis 2 and 23, the Bible says, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So Adam, for the first time, recognized that he was part of him. All the other things he saw, animals, birds, fish, plant, all these things, they were his but they were at least different. Their makeup was different. Their DNA was different. But this individual was part of him, and there was a special sense of connectedness that existed between the two of them. Genesis 2.24, we read, Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh, the Bible says. And verse 25 of the second chapter of the book of Genesis says, and they were both naked, man and his wife, and they were not the same. The language is to say that they were so connected that there was nothing in between them to make them feel different at each other. When they saw each other, they were one and the same. John 2 and verse 2, Jesus saying, 
Jesus. It's a narrow, it's a commentary of Jesus actually honoring marriage. And both Jesus was called and his disciple to a marriage in Cana. In fact, this is where Jesus performs his first miracle. Performs his f- first miracle, which means that Jesus, God, honors marriage. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, the Bible says, Marriage is honorable in all and bed undefiled, but warmongers and the adulterers God will furnish. So that means anyone that dishonors the marriage relationship and initiates divorce and undermines the marriage relationship and reduces marriage relationship to just a social agenda or a political agenda, Hence, providing the basis for marriage to be just another, another thing to joke about and play around, about, around with, then Bible clearly says God will destroy those people. Marriage created home. So what does the home constitute of father, mother, children? There are three distinct human beings involved in the construction of marriage. Father, mother, and children, three groups. Again, in God's home in heaven, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit again. So what we are seeing here is that marriage is a place of exercising patience, self-control, help, learning, and the more important place is the place of love. When Bible says God is love, doesn't mean that God is individual living out there and is creating things around to love. No, God himself had other personnel to love. God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The triune God is a very good example of an eternity of connectedness that really defines the idea of love. When God says God is love, it is not love in concepts or love in ideas, but love in real practical terms because of three personals included in the Godhead. You see, this is coming from a book, uh, Adventist Home, page 15, and it's interesting. Society is composed of families and is what the heads of the families make it. Out of their heart are the issues of life, the author said, and the heart of the community or of the church and of the nation is the household. The well-being of society, the success of the church, the prosperity of the nation depends upon home influence. If the home home influence is good, society is good, tribe is good, villages are good, nations is good, and everything else will be good. God prepared the first home. And look at this particular commentary. The Eden home of the first parents were prepared for them by God himself. Did you hear that? God prepared the home for Adam and Eve. When he had furnished it with everything that men could desire, he said, let us make men in our image after our likeness. So he created a home first, a home environment first, and then creates two individuals who will possess that home we call the Edenic home. And then the same book continues to say, the Lord was pleased with his last and noblest of all his creatures and designed that he should be the perfect inhabitant of a perfect world. But it was not his purpose that men should live in solitude. He said, it is not good that men should be alone. I will make him an elf meet for him. So home and men and then someone else to share and experience and connect and share love. And that was Eve. But that is not the end of the story. The unfortunate thing about the story of home and family is that there is an enemy that targeted the home in Aden. We know the story many, many times when we read the book of Genesis of of how Eve was tempted. The story says that Adam and Eve were not together. The devil actually tempted Eve. The question is, where was Adam? We don't know where Adam was at that point when Eve was tempted. The problem we see here is that there was a split 
in Adam and Eve's association. At that point in time, if the devil was looking for a way to penetrate into the life of humanity, to destroy humanity, it had to be when Adam and Eve were split. The Bible doesn't tell us, but we know that Eve was alone when the enemy came and tempted him. What does that tell us? It tells us that the union between the husband and the wife are so crucial in defense of faith, doctrine, and love. When a husband and a wife are not together in knowing God and saving God and being at a place of worship together, the home, whole home can potentially collapse. The enemy is targeting our home today. The same thing that he did because the devil has huge amount of experience. He tried it out in the Garden of Eden and it worked. He could only come and destroy the relationship when Adam and Eve initially split. So I personally believe that divorce is the idea that Satan got and learned from first-hand experience that only when divorce takes place, humanity can be corrupted many, many times over. You don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just look around and see ordinary people splitting up. And take a look at the children who are caught in the middle of that broken experience. They'll go away broken forever, and even in their own lifetime, their brokenness will not be healed. Satan's goal is to destroy life. If the children who are the product of this sacred institution can be displaced, the devil could succeed in displacing the whole world. This is my own statement. I'm reading again. Satan's goal is to destroy life. If the children who are the product of this sacred institution, which is home, can be displaced by divorce, devil has succeeded in displacing the whole world. The whole world is so corrupt, so immoral, so bad. And I tell you this, the people who are responsible, the worst gangster, the worst prostitute, the worst drug trafficker, if you trace down and find out who these individuals are, they have come from broken homes and dysfunctional homes. I repeat, they have come from broken homes and dysfunctional families. And when they go out of that kind of experience, they become a child of the devil million times over and create such uh, 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 chaos and problem in society at large. So the question is this, will he succeed in destroying humanity that is the devil? Well, the, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 14, the Bible says, seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us all fast to our profession. Jesus is the defense to save us from the mystery of sin, yes. Jesus is also the defense and the power to save us from the brokenness that I'm talking about. And if those brokenness come as a result of divorce and dysfunctional home and family, don't you think Jesus' high priest ministry is also there to administer and represent families so that the families will not have to go through this unfortunate experience of splitting and divorcing. 1 John 3, 8, the Bible says, He that commits sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Man was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. If the devil has found the basis to operate and destroy human being, and that basis is to start at the home and split the home, to have young people have kids out of wedlock. And these are the things that he had came up because in doing that, he can manufacture those personalities, his own personalities, his own satanic personalities, his own uh, images of sin, and he can inject those sinful characteristics and notions of lifestyle into those individuals who are human beings, but who are displaced and the home cannot provide the basis for a good quality life. The devil takes over and he creates them. 
And that's why Jesus Christ can provide defense for home. If your home is going through tough times, if you are an husband struggling to connect with your wife, if you are a wife struggling to connect with your husband, and you are wondering whether this is the right woman I have married, or wondering whether this is the right man I have married, I want to tell you, all those ideas that are floating in your mind are coming from the enemy and the devil to destroy you, your sons, your daughters, and your livelihood right now, and your livelihood in the future. Luke 4 and verse 18, the Bible says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and delivery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Jesus came to conquer the devil. Jesus didn't come to conquer the devil on the streets. You know, because the streets, you have the drug, drug traffickers, the prostitutes, and all these broken people are roaming around the streets. Yes, Jesus came to look for them there, but Jesus came also to heal broken homes because that's where the devil actually captures human life, employs them, teaches them how to live, live evil lives. And Jesus is also here to build broken homes, broken relationships, that what may be going wrong in the home, invite Jesus into that home, and the one who designed marriage at the first place will restore it back, and it will look beautiful just like what it was in the Garden of Eden. So, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, I want to recommend to you Jesus, who alone can heal our broken homes, dysfunctional homes, broken lives, and create us into perfect beings. And the good news is that Jesus is also the head of a home, is part of God's family. And because he has never experienced divorce, because he was never a child who grew between two parents who have displaced, because he knows the blessings of home. If we invite him, he will build us up from the shambles, from the brokenness. He will build us up again into his perfect image again. So, come to Jesus. May God bless you. Let me pray and ask God to bless us tonight. Close your eyes, please. Almighty God in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity you have given to us. Marriage is so important. The devil is playing around and making this institution something to joke about. Young people are playing around with it. Lord, I pray that you will help each one of us to make the decision to stand by you and to honor this very important institution that you have set up. Bless us, keep us faithful now. It's our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you again tomorrow night. God bless you.